PFAS are subject to various regulations in the United States. And they're also commonly known as forever chemicals, essentially man-made chemicals that have a certain structure, which means that they don't break down, hence the name. And our research conducted by my team in late 2023 found a source stating that there are more than 4,000 types of PFAS chemicals. Now, PFAS can be found in a broad range of different products. Perhaps it's mostly well known as, as, as a chemical that can be found in certain types of food contact materials, in particular non-stick cookware or the coating that is applied to the surface of non-stick cookware like this frying pan, but can also be found in food packaging, furniture, rugs, certain types of apparel, firefighting foam, paints, cosmetics. This is not an exhaustive list, it's just the examples that we could find. Let's begin by looking at 21 CFR, which applies to food contact materials. Now, the source on the FDA website states that certain types of PFAS are actually approved for use in the manufacture of nonstick cookware. And they also mentioned that several types of PFAS that the FDA has evaluated are approved also for use in food contact applications. You can find more information under the section titled Authorized Uses of PFAS in Food Contact Applications on the FDA website. It's a fairly detailed guide. Let's look, let's dive a bit deeper into, into this, this FAQ that I just mentioned. More specifically, the FDA website mentions the four following in, in the context that PFAS that are authorized for use in contact with food generally fall within the following categories. And once again, we have nonstick cookware, but they also mention gaskets, O-rings, processing aids, paper and paper board. Why is this, let's say, list of different products or types of food contact applications relevant? Because it's giving you a heads up in case you are buying or you, you're importing or manufacturing these products. In that case, PFAS testing or an evaluation of the bill of substances might be more urgent. Let's move on. We could also find restrictions or provisions related to PFAS under TSEA. This is on the ECFR. We could not find any, say, positive list of accepted PFAS or a negative list, including restrictions or limits or outright bans, but we could find reporting requirements dating back to 2001. This provides a specific, a list of specific substances here under tables. Now, this is not an exhaustive list either, but this can be accessed in the ECFR for TSEA. Something that's more recent and is also under TSEA is 40 CFR part 705. And again, this is something you can access under the ECFR, it's of course public information. They have provided an updated list, which also concerns, ready, sorry, reporting and also record keeping requirements for PFAS substances, if these are used in your manufacturing processes. If you're importing products, it can of course be challenging or next to impossible to know if a supplier, let's say in China or elsewhere, is using such substances. Other than 21 CFR and TSEA, there's also state level regulations in the United States that cover PFAS to some extent. First, we have the model toxics in packaging legislation, which has been adopted um, at least to some extent in 19 states and at least the number 19 that's what we could find last year in late 2023 could be updated now in any case this um, model toxic in packaging legislation it prohibits pfas and other substances in packaging materials so that's what we could find and this text can also be accessed examples of states can be found down here
Another state level regulation you may already have heard of is that of California Proposition 65. So California Prop 65 sets restrictions on chemicals and heavy metals in consumer products. This includes lead, cadmium, mercury, various types of phthalates like DHP, and it covers all sorts of consumer products. If a product contains a substance above a certain limit, then warning labeling requirements apply. There are a few more conditions, but that's the basics. And we could find the following mentioned as restricted under California Proposition 65 when it comes to PFAS. Okay, more from California. California AB652 product safety juvenile products it's hinted by the name this applies to sh different types of children's products and here we could find um, a specific concentration limit to 0 0.1 percent of the weight if i if i understand this correctly and that's a hard cap there's no warning labeling requirements in that sense it's you're prohibited from selling products that contain these substances above the set limits. Product examples can be found here on the left. And these are just examples, it's not an exhaustive list. We could also find two other state level regulations, one in Maine and one in New York. Now, keep in mind, this is again not an exhaustive list, this is what my team could find in late 2023. Um, they could have missed something. And of course, PFAS is also an area uh, which regulations are, uh, let's say, evolving. So I believe we will see a lot of develop developments uh, in, in the future. But a challenge when it comes to PFAS, at least in, within, in, in the US, is, is keeping track of restrictions that apply uh, on the federal level um, and those that apply in individual states. So how do I know if a product or material is subject to PFAS restrictions in the US? Well, it depends on the product scope. It depends on, let's say, if the product is a food contact material. Then you have to look into the provisions of 21 CFR, as mentioned earlier in this video. But it can also be a matter of which state or states you're selling in, or the age group, or a combination of all three. My recommendation, the way that we approach this, is that we are working with testing companies like Intertech, SGS, and Kima. And if we communicate the product type, age group, the material, the destination, and of course you may need to be a bit more specific than just say the US, and they can assess which PFAS regulations apply to this specific product. That is something they have to do anyway, as they provide a testing quotation, a lab testing quotation. Something that can be even more challenging, though, is assessing which specific PFAS to test for. As I mentioned, we found a source stating that more than 4,700 types of PFAS. I think we also found an EU source stating that there are more than 10,000. Anyway... I'm not sure which one is right, but it's too many for us to keep track of. So once again, testing companies like, well, qualified testing companies like Intertech, Kima, SGS, and so on. As part of their, let's say, lab testing assessment, when they provide a quotation, they need to assess which regulations that concern PFAS may apply. And part of this is also to go a bit more granular and then determine which specific PFAS to test for. We do not make this assessment in-house. We're not qualified to do that. We work with qualified testing companies instead. Okay, um, just scratching the surface here on PFAS, and I'm sure a lot will happen in the future, but I hope I gave you at least a broad overview and let, uh, a somewhat practical approach to how you can ensure PFAS, well, compliance with PFAS restrictions going forward, working with qualified testing companies. And if you want to learn more about compliance related topics, then go to compliancegate.com.